you found your way to the Winning Tactics podcast with host Adam Sinkis. Adam discusses winning tactics with small business owners and entrepreneurs, uncovering processes and introducing the tools and solutions for enhancing the bottom line. Thanks again for finding your way to the Winning Tactics podcast and now your host, Adam Sinkis. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday, everybody. It is June 4th, and the only reason I know that is because I can see the date on the bottom of my computer. I lose track of the date all the time. Uh, It is 1 o'clock on Thursday, June the 4th. I am happy to have with me the complete creative, Russell. I am not going to butcher your last name because I know I will. Uh, Nolte, I believe is how it's pronounced. It is. Had a got it right. <laughs> hey, winning. All right. Uh, Russell is the complete creative. He talks a lot about bringing creativity and innovation into your business. And that is where we are going to go today uh, on our discussion on the Winning Tactics podcast. So uh, we'll start off. Russell, first of all, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. I love all your Cthulhu stuff in the background. Super, super cool. Uh, but uh most importantly, got to tell everybody who you are and, and exactly what you do and what you're about. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, those are some of our books back there. So uh, I do. A, I, I edit a, and publish a book series called Cthulhu is Hard to Spell. I'm a USA Today bestselling author. I run a company called Wannabe Press and a training academy called The Complete Creative, which is the educational arm of Wannabe Press. And I basically help creatives build better businesses. Fantastic. So let's jump into it because I think, uh, especially with with the current times, I am not going to say these unprecedented times that term absolutely bothers the crap out of me because we're just numb to it. But during the these times where, from a business standpoint, we've all been challenged, um, you know, creativity and, and innovation is is really become critical to survival at this point. So. Um, what does creativity in your business really mean? Let's, let's start there with a the definition. So I mostly work with creative, so it's a little bit easier to define this. <laughs> it would be the creative work that you put out. But I think in any business, it's still the, the work that you put out is the creative part of this. A lot of people, uh, you know, they call, they, they say that creative is, Uh, you know, the ad copy or the marketing copy. But I think anything that you're bringing into the world that is unique to your company is the creative part of this. So this might be uh, new courses. It might be a new product. uh, It might be a new chair, uh, whatever it is. Like there's the the creativity behind that is uh, and the thought process behind that is the creative work of any business. Yeah, no, I I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, you know, and we have to, I think, from a, a just a marketing standpoint, right? We have we have to be creative in what we bring to the market, right? Because there's you know a thousand marketers, there's a thousand copywriters, there's a thousand business consultants, there's a thousand little retail stores that are selling men's clothes or women's clothes or whatever, and so. Um, that leaves buyers, potential buyers, just a, a ton of options. So I, I think you're you're right, and we have to think about everything we do from a creative perspective in, in what we're doing in our business. And obviously, uh, with what you do with working specifically with creatives, uh, there there is a lot bigger piece of that because that is their work, is the creativity itself. So. Yeah, it's so uh-huh. interesting because uh, with creatives, it's very easy to talk about the creative part and very hard to talk about the business part. Uh, with most entrepreneurs, it's the opposite. It's very easy to talk about the business part and almost impossible to talk about the creative part with them. Uh, but this sort of, I've broken it down to two ways to run a business. Uh, there's like, there's probably, there's dozens more and like, I'm definitely oversimplifying it, but you could be in a, you could be in a race to do the same thing as every other human. And then you're on a race to the bottom, or you can be on a race to separate yourself from everybody else. 
And uh, then you could be on a, a race to the top. You, you could be the most expensive part of an industry instead of the cheapest part of an industry. Um, when you become a commodity, you end up, like I said, being in a race to the bottom. Uh, then mm -hmm. all you can all you can compete on is 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 is, is price. Uh, but in any industry, there's a creative way to be uh, to be unique in what you're offering and to accentuate that offer part of it and then find customers who care about that offer that you're doing. Um, most companies can't scale. Like, like they'll never scale. Like most companies just don't work at scale. And unfortunately, as we are creators, uh, we're always told to, uh, to, to, to get scale in your company. But you only really need scale if your price is cheap. If your price is expensive, you don't need scale. You need the right customers, not the most customers. Yes, I love that you call that out. The right customers is, is such a huge part of it. Uh, so many businesses are chasing the every customer instead of the customer that they solve a specific problem for. And so uh, that is, in, in my mind, a, a critical call out. Uh, you don't have to be the cheapest. You don't have to be uh, you know, the best value in town from a dollars and cents standpoint. You need to be the best value in town from a, what you offer versus what somebody is willing to pay for you. Right. So I'm, I'll give you an example. I run a comics book and book company, and uh, I don't care about boxes. I don't care about boxes. Uh, uh, they like whatever the, I go on Amazon or Uline or whatever and get like the boxes that the boxes are that like they're just whatever the size is. Mm -hmm. Except uh, when I'm shipping comics, I very much care, and I especially pay a uh, 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 a soft cover of books. I very much care about the box, and so I will spend fifty cents or more a box to get these Gemini mailers uh, because okay. they are the absolute best thing for shipping comics and soft cover things. Uh, uh, hardcover books I care less about because they're hardcover books. Like they survive through, like you can even put them in a bubble mailer and they'll probably survive. At least uh, won't be destroyed. Uh, so again, even though I don't care about boxes 95% of the time, uh, uh, I do care very much about boxes uh, when it comes to shipping comics. And I mm -hmm. also very much care about boxes when shipping internationally. So there are places in every customer's life where they don't care about the thing. But then, but but for every person who cares very deeply about Gemini mailers, most people don't, and they care very deeply about some other kind of box. It could be double, double corrugated, or it could be, uh, it, it could be like the the packing material or whatever. I don't know why I'm talking about boxes so much, but it's just like such a commod commoditized idea. Like it is, and yet there are companies that like exist to make specialized boxes for people. And, and then the, we're not even bringing up like people that are using uh, boxes to ship like um, uh, 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 specialized specialized boxes for for specific products or for those subscription boxes or something like that. So even in an industry that seems as boring as boxes, sorry if you make boxes, like I'm I'm, I'm trying to help you by showing it's not a boring industry. But like when you think about a boring industry, like boxes was right there. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, like you talk about corn, uh, corn is corn, right? Well, that's not cool. Like uh, organic corn tastes way better than like corn that's been sitting out for a while. Like there's all sorts of ways to compete in industries that you think there's no way to compete in that is better than just racing to the bottom because racing to the bottom literally does nothing except make you compete on price. And if you compete on price, you must hit scale and scale yep. is the hardest thing to do in a company. It's, that is why most companies fail before they can scale uh, because yeah. they don't have enough runway to get to profitability at scale. Now, if you want to run a huge company or a VC backed company or something, then like you're going to have to scale. But most of us are going to be running lifestyle companies and mm -hmm. a lifestyle companies, even in my industry where like is books are basically a commodity. Like books are a book is a book, like, like they are very low priced. They have very low margin. Like they are a bad industry to get into if you want to like make money uh, because uh, they're time intensive, expensive, cost a very little bit. You kind of have to hit scale, except I don't hit scale. Like I've only got a few thousand people who buy our books, but those, those few thousand over the course of 20 or 30 books has given me the amount of 
readership that I need to like keep my company going. Uh, yeah. I also run my training academy. So our main email list is 20,000 people uh, for my books. But last year I made $60,000 on a mailing list of 300 people. Yeah. And that's, that's just taking a creative approach to what you're doing and, and then taking the, the, the marketing piece to it. Uh, well, there's and, basically and really three ways to start. It. I mean, there's three ways to compete in a market. You know, the first is cost. Uh, mm -hmm. We already talked about cost. That's you're probably not going to be able to get the lowest cost because you can't hit scale. That's why people hit millions and millions and millions of dollars into something like Facebook before they like get any return for it. Uh, yep. The second way is convenience. So, so uh, that's a company like McDonald's. McDonald's is not the cheapest. Uh, going to the grocery store and buying it is the cheapest. Uh, <laughs> By far. Uh, 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 the, the, they are the most convenient. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the third way, which is on price. And it's very hard to be convenient because it means you have to be all over the place. And, mm -hmm. and again, you are spreading yourself thin on scale. Uh, a a, a price-based approach or a value-based approach means that you can get something that is incredibly expensive and find very few people for it. And mm -hmm. like that is a that is a methodology that I can get behind because, you know, scale is almost luck. It's really luck. I mean, if you think about a company like Dropbox, like there's no reason why Dropbox should have succeeded, why all these other companies, because I remember when Dropbox came on, it was not the best. No, nope. uh, it was, it was, it was, there were, there were, I used to use this company called SugarSync, which was like thousands <laughs> of times better than Dropbox. But where's SugarSync now? It ain't ubiquitous. It ain't, it ain't ubiquitous. No one, people yep. are using Dropbox. And on some level, like there's the marketing and the other stuff, but like the other companies had a better product and equal amounts of money and yet Dropbox could scale. And so I really, I, 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 there's no scale without some amount of luck in the same way that like Facebook, why Facebook? Why not any of the other ones that were around? Yeah. Like they just happened to be in the right place at the right time with the right money and the right team. Uh, and I hate, uh, I, I hate the idea that like I have to rely on luck. So I always want to do the things that I can do. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting. You, you talk about relying on luck. And I think in business, uh, there there is some luck involved. But I've always defined luck as, uh, as this, right? The difference between, be, between people that are good and bad at something is the amount of times they get lucky. Uh, and, and you only get lucky more when you start putting the right pieces in play or start setting yourself in the right trajectory to be at the right place at the right time. And so it, it is part of, part of business's luck finding the right investor, the right team, the right employee, the right, you know, the, the right piece. Um, but it's, it's knowing when to, I think it's equally, it's knowing when to cut the wrong pieces loose so that you can bring in the right piece. Absolutely. I guess my point is just like, I would prefer to have a company that I know could survive mm -hmm. instead of one that would be built upon. Like, and every ad you see is like, create a mini offer, scale this way, get 50,000 people on a mailing list. And like, I think it's so pervasive and so ugly and so horrible because it, it, it goes against the thing that you should really be focused on a business, which is like the two things that matter, uh, customer, product, and profit. If you have a customer yep. and you make a product for them that has a profit margin, you can reinvest that money into marketing and then you have a company. Like until you have those three things, you don't have a company. And most people are worried about scale before they have a product. And most entrepreneurs that I talk to, whether creative or not creative, I ask them like, who is your perfect customer? Like who buys your product? And every single time, almost without fail, uh, no, without fail, I actually don't remember the last time that someone gave me an answer that was more than, well, they're like 35 to 40 year old men who like sandals and eat soup. And I'm like, that's nothing. Like that's nothing. Like that's nothing. I was like, I want you to tell me one human being and, and break down who they are and what they do. And most importantly, like what they're about. Uh, yeah. Behind me, there's a, there's a, a, a painting of, uh, of our, our mascot, Melissa the wannabe, who is, uh, not a human, but she is the um, the amalgamation of what makes a perfect customer for want to be press. She's strong and rebellious and sarcastic and artistic and creative and uh, no nonsense and anti-authority. She went to punk rock clubs when she was a kid uh, before she grew up and probably got a job she hated. Uh, and 
like all of those things, like, you know, like, sure, she graduated college or whatever, but like, I don't care about that part. I care about like the, 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 the underlying, uh, someone told me psycho, it's called psychographic information that, uh, that makes up this person. Cause I've got mm -hmm. fans from 18 to 80 and I swear, like they, they look nothing alike except in how they talk. <laughs> and like the things that they say and what they groove on and like the like are all the same. Yep. Uh, but uh, so like, and, and, and like I'm making a product for them. And like, look, uh, for years I was, I, I had, I made, you know, like decent money, you know, 40 or 50 grand like a year for the first couple of years we were in business. And like, I made no money, but like I spent that time really trying to eagerly follow the, the customer and find out what they liked, what they didn't like. We had good launches. We had, abysmal launches like just horrible launches uh and it I still have horrible launches sometimes it's every time i go away from like our core principles and our core philosophy and where we built our audience like i end up having a bad time and so uh i i i i i i hate scale for that reason it prevents it like it takes you away from the thing that really matters which is learning who your customer is so well that you never have to ask i don't know what my customer wants since that yeah. day where I really learned who they were, I had never like been like, what should I make for them? I have said, oh, do I think that they will like that thing? And uh, no, I don't think they'll like that thing. But I've never been like, I don't know, what should I make for them next? Like I know factually like what they like because they have told me over years. And mm -hmm. then I scaled, but uh, I spent years uh, maybe too long, but years trying to figure out who that customer was, why they buy from me, why they bought from me, what was different about my work than other people's work, and yeah. and, uh, and and this I, this obsession with scale is uh, is like killing mo more most companies. Yep. No, I I am one hundred percent on you with that. Like there is, so in my mind there once you identify kind of a core product of what, what you essentially what you think you want to offer out to your audience, right? There, there's really a, an exercise that, that every company should be going through and it's to divine, divine, define your vision, mission, and values, first of all, right? And then ask yourself, does my product support my vision, mission, and values? Where do I, where I want to go, and, and who I who I am, or who I want to represent as a company? And then the next piece of that is then to define what uh, what problem you solve for what you think your target customer is, right? And the, and, and the key there is not just what problem do I solve, but it's uh, it's actually going out and testing. Does my product actually solve that problem? Yes, yeah, I think that all of that is like flipping it the wrong way. Like to me, the question is like, who is your audience? Who are you serving? And then all of those questions answer themselves. Like, you know, these thought the thought exercise of what are you what like what like what am I about? Like it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. What matters is like what you are in relation to the people who you buy, who, who buy from you and and how you best define that part of it and how you come across. So it's a much better exercise to go find someone who's in your ideal audience um, when I'm happy to walk someone through how to find that and then use that to say, what are the values that people see in me? And are they the ones that I want to be projecting? And then, because uh, otherwise it's, 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 a, it's an academic exercise that that, uh, usually, uh, that usually blows up in people's faces because they say, well, these are the values and these are the things. And then they go out and they sell a thing and they're like, oh crap, like this isn't the thing at all. This isn't the, this is the thing that all people want from me. And until you know what people want from you, like defining your values and all of those other things uh, can only ever be so effective. Uh, yes, I, I get what you're saying. I, I, I definitely get what you're saying. I think it's, uh, I, I think it, you have to be you have to be very sort of speak customer focused throughout the whole process right and and that's you know that that's i always take a marketing mindset to it right so so i want to know who i want to kind of identify myself internally as a person as you know what am i where am i thinking i want to go with my company and 
uh, it, it's it's a moment. I use it more as the, those first pieces is self reflection. Uh, but I, I I love your premise that you should be fitting into what your customers want or what you think your ideal customers want. Right. Um, and, so and chasing here's the, here's the problem with that is like nobody cares what your perception is of you. Like all that matters is your perception on the market and like what people think of you that are on the market. So uh, those I'm not saying self reflection is bad. Self reflection is good, uh, but uh, but like what really matters is what has is can you take that and move it to the audience and see what yep. how other people are dealing with you. So I have this process that basically helps people scale from one to a thousand plus people. And it really starts very, uh, very simply. It starts with one person, one human being. And most people don't even have one person. I'm going to assume that the people that don't have any audience, if you have any, if you have some audience or people that bought from you, you can kind of, uh, uh, move a little bit forward from here. Uh, but mm -hmm. assuming you have no audience, the easiest thing to do is to find somebody who likes you, but not enough to lie to you. Uh, so that means uh, a person who is not family, is not a close friend. The best example that I have is somebody who uh, is like your high school, in front, you, they used to hang out with in high school, but you haven't talked to in years, or even someone you didn't yeah. so much hang out to in high school, but like you kind of saw in high school and somehow was like, tangentially in your friend group and you've for some reason been a Facebook friends with them for like a decade and like you like them but like you're really not sure why they're they're uh they're liking and commenting on everything that you post about this one topic um yeah and 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 this goes to like this is not like if you're going to make a company like a bicycle this is not like people that follow your knitting posts you're almost always if you're a business going to going to be thinking and talking about the thing that you're about to make before you make it uh, because like you're just start getting consumed with like where like like what uh, and why and where and like this industry just sort of consumes your life. And so uh, when you're posting, let's just say bicycles, like these are people that are commenting about your bicycle posts or like whatever the post that you're making. And uh, just in a in a in a oddly like high frequency based on the level of friendship that you have with them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so. Those are the people that like we're going to call your ideal customer right now. These are people who've already gone through no like and trust. They know, they like, they trust you. They haven't bought from you yet because you're not selling anything yet. Um, but those, that is the person who you start with and you, 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 you start figuring out the psychographic information about them and why they like you. This is really important for me because you might be projecting something that you don't want to project. Mm -hmm. You might have values that you don't actually. You might. You may be projecting values that are that are uh, not the ones that you think that are your values. Um, people may be catching up on something that, like, you really thought you conveyed, but you, but but like, you want to make more. You you want to you want to bring stuff up. So it's all about like these are the traits that people want for like for me. What they don't like for me. All of that stuff. It's not about demographics, uh, but like you want to collect the demographic information for your audience insights and such later. Uh, so you want to get all that information. Uh, you know, most of my customers, have, our clients, have had like a, have, have had sales, so they can go into their customer records yep. and see like, wow, who has been around me the longest? Who has spent the most on me for the longest amount of time? And that becomes the first people that you reach out to talk to. But if you don't have that, then you can at least use like your social media presence to kind of amalgamate that. And mm -hmm. if you're really looking to find, you know, that, that I, I go from like one to 10 and like one part one is that one person part 10 is do it nine more times. Yeah. By that time, you're going to find all of those people who you're going to find all of the commonalities and all of the differences. And like, uh, what five people say or six people say or all of those pieces, where they go and hang out, like what communities are good, what communities are bad, uh, all of the things that you need to know. And you're going to figure out the marketing because they're going to start using the same words over and over and over again related to your product. Uh, so uh, that is at the point where I say, okay, what did they all say? Uh, oh, is this the, are these the customers I want? Uh, are they, do they have money? Are they willing to buy a thing that I said, like, where are they? And like, I go into the actual communities that like they told me about and I'm like, oh, I don't want to talk to these people or I really do want to talk to these people. Like this is completely right. So, yeah. uh, and that, that's the point that I can go back and make my values 
and that that's when I think at that nascent stage where I'm like, okay, I still don't have a company because I'm not selling them anything, but at least I know like what they expect from me, what they like from me. And here is what my customer base looks like, at least in a nascent stage. Now, what values should I have to serve them the best? Because again, like my the values that I want to convey might not serve them best, but mm -hmm. they might want somebody more aggressive or more passive, or I don't know like what the thing is. And that's why I say like, the things that you convey and that you can double down on are the easiest way to build your audience because, uh, and the easiest way to like build a company that succeeds. Because instead of doing a thought exercise now, uh, which I think is there's there's just value in that. Uh, but I think people, the reason I I, 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 I I caution people about it is because then people spend a year doing their value exercise and they never talk to the people that are around them or they never yeah. talk to their customer. So if you can do it in a couple of hours or a day of like reflection, and then you can do this other part, that's great because now you have a hypothesis of what your values are. You've now then talked to people who then have their values and you can now compare and contrast all of those people. Um, and then you kind of have to do some work. So step three is pre-validation of the process. So you wanna create something small. I like $20 because $20 is like, no one's just gonna placate you with $20, but it's mm -hmm. also not so much that uh, it's, it's, it's not like, 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 like people care that much about a $20 bill. Like they waste $20 yeah. bills all the time, but it means something to them. I don't like $1 or $5 or I, I want like something that I think people are going to watch. And it could be, you might, it might be a book that's $20 or it might be a part of that bicycle. Maybe it's a kickstand or a, or, or, or a handlebar or something, or even the grips on a handlebar that are $20, whatever it is, your goal is to like, these people told you what they wanted. Uh, and now you got to, you need proof. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the only way you get proof is actually like putting your money, putting uh, if, if they put their money where their mouth is. And so yep. uh, because you have, you know, like, and trust somebody, uh, these people know, like, and trust you, you've gotten the most of the way through your funnel. And now it's really just like, okay, so what are you going to buy now? And you, 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 now you're testing, putting up PayPal pages or whatever until I like to say eight to have 10 people buy. Uh, most people freak out when I say eight of 10 people because that's such a high number. But like these are people, your ideal people. So yeah. I get five, at least five people buy uh, that have made it to the bottom of your funnel. The more people that buy at the bottom of your funnel, the, the more money you have to work with at the top of your funnel. Uh, so now you have a product and a customer and a profit. And now you're just using that money to find more customers, going into Facebook groups, scaling from 10 to 100. Once you mm -hmm. have about 100 uh, people that you're working your way through that funnel, working your way through that, that now you're building the funnel out. Like, like, what are the things that they like about me? What can I say? How do I maximize getting someone who doesn't know me all the way down to trusting me and buying from me? And you're working and you've got about 100 customers. Once you've got 100 customers, that's when you actually are validating the product. Validate the product. Uh, run a Kickstarter. I like Kickstarter for validating a product because it's kind of like a, if you bring a hundred people, they'll bring a hundred people kind of scenario. Like if mm -hmm. you've got a crowd, then uh, they'll bring more of their crowd to you. And now you've got about 200 people, hopefully that buy from you, that bought your, that bought your validated product. And now you've proven that your values work. You've proven yeah. that customer base is relevant. You've proven that your funnel from no, not knowing you to buying from you is is rock solid. And now, and you have a profit margin that you can use to go find more people like them. And uh, I, I, I use this, I use this and talk about this strategy a lot only because uh, I don't, I, I believe people put too much emphasis on what they think their values are, which matter so little comparatively to what your audience thinks your values are and what they will actually buy from you. And your job yeah. is to align those two things as closely as possible. So, hey, you really want a bike, but I want to make a motorcycle. I don't know, like maybe I'll make an electric bicycle, whatever that is, and moving them slowly towards the thing you actually want them to buy. Yeah, no, I think that's a great call out. Um, I like that you mentioned the fact that going through the the thought, the academic exercise of kind of that self-reflection uh, needs 
I, I, I still wholeheartedly believe it's important, but you, you hit the nail on the head. You can't spend a year doing this. It, it's got to be like a day, a week, you know. Um, it's got to be a relatively short period, and you have to be really open and honest with yourself. You have to be prepared to be open and honest with yourself. You also have to period. be prepared to be wrong. This is the yes. other thing <laughs> do in this in this exercise. Is they're like, no, these are the values, and like if your if your audience is like, nah, I don't care about that stuff. Like I I care about this stuff. Either you've got to like find a new audience. Uh, which might not resonate with like the way you're talking naturally. And like you, they may, or you have to go back to that person and be like, all right, I'm guess I'm ripping up this values chart. And like the real value I care about is honesty and integrity, not like quality and craftsmanship or whatever. I don't know what the thing yeah. is that you, that, that, that like you're, so uh, it gets, you have to be, and, and this whole process that we just talked about, or I just talked about, you have to be willing to be wrong. Because that first person is going to tell you something and 90% of it's going to be wrong. And then those 10 people are going to tell you what product they want. And then no one's going to buy it. And you're going to be like, but you said. And, 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 and so you have to be willing to be like, okay, this is what you say. But out of the side of the mouth, this side of your mouth, this is what you're telling me you actually need. And this mm -hmm. is what the values that I want are, that I want to convey. And this is what you said. And like, they kind of match up in these ways. It's very hard for me to believe someone who cares about integrity won't have a bunch of audience people who care about integrity too. Um, it's just maybe not be, won't be the top three things that they say. And you really yeah. want to emphasize like the top, if everybody says one thing, then like that is a thing you really want as your value, even though it might be 10th on your chart. You want it to be one if like literally everybody says it. Well, yeah. And, and so the other thing to think about, and you talk about, you know, melding the values together in what, what they say and what you say. Um, the other thing to think about is that a lot of times people word things different ways. So you can, you can look at those and go, there might be three or four values that you heard that really group into one value that, pretty much aligns with what you, what you think should be a value. And so you have to, you have to be prepared to not only look at it, listen to it and hear what they're saying, but you have to be able to analyze it and really break it down to what's going to be a successful piece here of right, your strategy. Absolutely. And that is why I spend so much time in those first couple of stages. Like, I don't care if you spend a year on those first couple of stages, like you probably should spend like an inordinate amount of time on those first people to make sure it's right because it's literally the foundation for hopefully the next 10 or 20 years of your life. So yep. you want to, you want to spend all of your time in like, if you're doing the, uh, it, it, and, and really like drill down about like, wow, how, like I thought that what people liked about me was my fourth righteousness, but what they're saying is like that. I, they, they like that I'm funny and I've never found myself funny. So like, I guess maybe I should take like funny classes or something. I don't know. Like, but it will tell you what you need to amplify about yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, once, once people say what they love about you the most, uh, you're going to have to kind of align yourself with those. And yeah. it might mean like taking elocution lessons. It might mean like uh, 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 doing a whole lot of things that you may or may not be comfortable with. Uh, but once you align and your customer aligns, then it really becomes about planting your flag in as many places as possible. So for instance, like, I'm very tired right now on this podcast. Like it's just a tiring process. But one of the things that people say again and again is that they like the passion that I show when I'm on these shows, like the passion comes through. And so I make sure to like drink extra coffee in the morning to like uh, make sure to like double down yep. on the- We hit the Mountain Dew myself, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but all of those things, all of those things that we talked about, the rebellious nature, the practical nature, like the 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 way that I can like take difficult concepts and break them down easily, all of those things are things that I have to showcase on all of the shows that I go on. And it's yeah. over years I've learned, okay, I've got 40 minutes, probably, maybe an hour on this, on these shows. And uh, so I really, really, really have to make sure that I accentuate all of the best values, the stuff that people really like about wannabe press and the complete creative. Because if I do, then 
hopefully some of those people who are on who who like are on your show will come and look at the complete creative as well or like yep. read my books or like whatever that thing is that that action but it's not just about that call to action at the end of like your thing or like go buy or go look at this it's breaking down those objections every minute that you're on a show or every word that's on your web page so that people are willing to take that call to action because a call to action to be a call to action is like nothing no one has ever nothing I, I i didn't like has ever swayed me with the call to action the the, yeah. the difference is when i really like something and then they tell me what to do then i'm like yes but people spend way too much time on that call to action should it be green or yellow or blue or pink or i don't know let's split test everything and much less time on like the copy that gets somebody excited or like the hour before I tell you like to go check out the complete creator or whatever on the show that people are like, man, I really like that guy's energy. Um, yeah. And part of that also is in while you're attracting the right person, you're repelling the wrong person um, and saying, wow, that guy is way too much for me. Or like, uh, you know, uh, I don't really like how we said this or that, whatever the thing is. But the more that you are amplifying the, your good qualities, your and, and you're kind of cutting away your bad qualities, but as you cut away your bad qualities uh, uh, or amplify your good qualities, some people are going to think those are bad qualities. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a great call out. You know, I liken it to this uh, when you when you go onto a website, whether it be a, a retail website or uh, you know or a, a, a service website where you're looking to really legitimately looking to make a purchase. And you start reading down and like you can get two or three sentences in and you're like, man, that is a really expensive product. I don't even know how much it costs, but I can tell you it's expensive. Right. right. And that that's that disqualification or qualification process uh, that that says whether I want to do business or not. And and you're right. You know, the call to action is, is shouldn't be something that you should be focused on. It should be something that supplements everything else you've already done. Right, like I, I'm about to launch this new book, the book series uh, uh, in a week uh, on Kickstarter. So I'm spending, the, I spent the last month basically being like, this book is awesome. This book is awesome. You should go buy it. You should go do it. Here's why this book is awesome. Here's why you'll love it. Here's why I made it for you. Here, all of the reasons why, and like giving people no reason to say no and every reason to say yes. And then like, you should go buy it. Go check this part out. Go check this part out. Make sure you download the free samples. So like, you know, if it's your jam, and and doing all of those, but making sure there are call to actions so the right people do take action. But mm -hmm. the call to action is like the icing on the cake of the rest of the copy or the rest of the overall persona. You know, yeah. every, every article that I write on the complete creative is like about targeting the right kind of person. And that is what most businesses sorely lack. They sorely lack the ability to say, I know exactly how, how that's written or man, I, I bet that, that that sounds like it was written just for me. And my favorite comment on any post that I ever do is, wow, it was like you were speaking directly to me or get out of my head or something like that. Because yep. I know that you have to get that granular. Like you can't make something for everybody because then it will resonate with nobody. You have to make it so granular that like somebody will look at it and be like, Oh my God, it's like you were staring into my brain. And yes, now I will give you money because like you said mm -hmm. the exact thing that I need to hear. And it's only because I know my audience so well, both really, there's a lot of overlap between want to be pest and cre complete creative, but they are different as well. Cause I know both audiences so well that I know what they need to hear before they want to say yes. And then once they want to say yes, all I have to do is give them a reason to say yes and to make sure that depending on the value of the thing, the cost of the thing, that I have made it uh, exciting enough that they will take that leap. Yep. No, I, I absolutely love that. I think it's interesting. This is why companies like Coke and Pepsi and Amazon and eBay and Microsoft spend you know millions upon millions of dollars on copywriters uh, every year to uh, to launch their products, to make press releases and all this stuff because they hire people that build this really tailored message for specific audiences. And, and so that's a, a huge call out businesses, marketing, 
you got to be super, super specific as to who you're targeting or else it's just not going to work. Yeah, but you also have to know who your audience is to target. Like mm -hmm. the really crazy part about people saying that they don't know who their audience is, is that if you knew, like they would just tell you, like they are happy to tell you what they need and why they like you. They will give you all of the answers that you will ever need for the rest of your life about like what you should do. And if you stop resonating with them, guess what? They will tell you that too. Like if suddenly like half your audience leaves, you're like, oh crap, what did I do? Uh, but uh, you need, so you need to make sure that like you, you know that audience because the rest of it is easy. Like mm -hmm. most copywriting is calling the other customer, the, the customers of the, of the brand and hearing what they say and then regurgitating that on the page. Like if you really want to just up your copywriting game or become a professional copywriter, it's like. 10% actual writing and 20 and like 80% journalism of like, you, yep. you I, I would be like, Hey, Adam, uh, what is the, who's your top five customers? Awesome. Can you email them and just let them know that I'm going to call them? Uh, and like, I'll, I'll, and then, or I'm going to email them and try and set up a half hour time where I can talk to them. Sure. And so you spent three hours, you talk to the top five customers, they tell you literally what they love, what they hate. They give you the testimonials. They write all of the copy for you. You don't yep. have to do much of this work if you know the audience. So like the people that don't know their audience are like refusing to like build the audience or know, have like a community around those people are, are like making their work so much harder because like if you just knew they would tell you, like they would tell you, like life is so much easier. Like they will say, I love that. I hate that. Where can I buy that? Oh man, the do this. Don't do this. I love it when he does this. I hate it when he does that. And like, all you got to do then is be like, cool. Uh, now where are these other people hanging out? And like your audience will also tell you exactly where they're hanging out. They mm -hmm. will tell you, they will, they will tell you, they will refer people to you. Like they will do all of the work for you and all you have to do then is pour some gasoline on that little fire and it will become like a huge raging ember yeah no i love it uh you know i was talking to patty mara on tuesday's show this week and we were talking about relationship selling and it's it's this it's the same concept right and, and we talked about a lot of businesses have physical pre presence with their customer and it's training your team to ask those questions while you're while they're interfacing with the customer, whether you're a retail store, whether you're a service provider, whatever, you know, uh, what did you like about our services today? What could we have done better for our services today? Why did you choose us over our competitors? You know, asking all those questions during the the sales and service process, uh, right? And, and and actually asking it, not just doing a survey afterwards. Yeah, no, so actually you, asking it. If there is a company called Long Beach Creamery by my house. And I swear to God, it's like they make every flavor for me, but they have never one time asked me about it, but I can tell that they do so much. They did so much work at the beginning to figure this part out that they didn't need to ask me. Like, they know it now. Like they yep. knew. And like, once you know it, then like every post, I'm just like, yes, this is a great post. Like, yeah, I, I, I can't believe I'm freaking following like a, a, a an ice cream store <laughs> like uh I, I feel stupid following an ice cream store but i do because like every week they put out new flavors and like i want to get those new flavors because they've done such a good job of of of, 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 of targeting their right customer without ever asking me a question because they are mm -hmm. asking other people questions or they built out that that like ethos or that like brand identity so that they know what to do and uh, you can just tell that like they take care with that stuff and yeah. most companies do not. So uh, I mean, Ben and Jerry's is another great example. Like, I don't know if you saw their like, they're like, they're like a uh, uh, thing about, uh, about all of the riots that they put out. Like they know their customer, like they, they know that like, that's going to resonate with the people that buy from them. And like, yeah. like they're, they're making a press release. And they're they're sticking to their values, but they also know that like the the their 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 sales are likely going to spike by putting out that because it's baked into the company. Like you don't buy Ben and Jerry's 
like thinking that they're going to like be po have a positive view of like the Department of Defense. Like that's not what the brand is. The brand is like two old hippies from mm -hmm. Vermont, and uh, and and because it's baked into the ethos of everything, like everything they do moves the brand forward, and that's it's really like what we're talking about about knowing your customer. Like it sounds really boring like it's all boring things to like be like know your customer and like send out surveys and ask all these questions what you're trying to do is create a brand identity that i that 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 will serve you for decades that will be able to grow with you and mold with you and keep the customers with you and be able to find new people so that you have to do less work because because entrepreneurs do way more work than they have to do Yes, I agree. We work way too hard as entrepreneurs to try and put the hustle and grind in. We need to work smarter, not harder. Uh, and that is building that really strong foundation of knowing who your customer is from the get go so that you can just you can scale that down the road. You can also look at is there another demographic of customer that I want to test down the road that might be interested in this or a variation of what I offer? too. So it's it's just about being smart with that. We are getting towards the end of time here. So we are going to go into our to final thoughts. So uh, I definitely appreciate everything that you've brought to the table. You've brought some really, really powerful information for small business owners. Uh, what is that one thing that they should take away from our conversation today? Well, I already talked to be, uh, uh, know your customer like a dead horse. So I'm going to go with the advice that I give every single time if I can, which is you must find a way to divorce your self-worth from your success or failure. You will. I uh, Last year, I went through a period of like the worst launches of my whole career, probably maybe since I started. Um, and I had a lot of success before then. And this was like, a hundredth of the previous success that I've had, like like just tens of thousands of dollars wasted on these products. And I got to the point last year around this time where like I was suicidal. I was like so bad. Like I was like, I was, I was just ready to end it all. And it was all because I took, I, 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 I latched myself so hard to that like self-worth when I was going up. And when I came down, uh, there's no way to just like divorce it on the way down and like only do it on the way up. Uh, and it's real fun to like to to to, uh, to get the self worth train on the way up. But down uh, and down will happen for everybody. Everyone will peak. Every at some point of your life, uh, your product will peak, and uh, it will. And maybe you can. Maybe there will be a dip and then another spike. But there will be a dip and. If you if you if you consider yourself a success or failure based on how much money you make, like you will not survive in this game. The only way to survive is to look at yourself and 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 and, and the way I survive is I now can look and say I am a person who succeeds. I'm a person who failed at this. I'm also a person who writes, and a person who reads, and a person who is a father. And I'm not a father, an uncle, and uh, and and uh, and. Uh, and uh, and husband and all of these other things and like a complete circle of a person. Um, also, are if you if you tie yourself to yourself on the way up, like you become kind of a massive dick. Uh, not all the time, but like it's definitely like look at how successful I am. Um, uh, hopefully, I didn't like I was able to not like do that because I always was worried that it would come down. Um, but uh, I. Uh, this game is so hard and there's so many ups and downs. And at the beginning, it's all up because like, it's like, Oh, yep. every, there's like nowhere to go, but up you start at one and then, you know, you go to 10, it's like a huge increase. But if you go to 10 and then you go back down to nine, your brain, uh, your brain uh, uh, still thinks that 10 is the new baseline. So nine is a failure. It doesn't make sense, but it is how it works. So yep. uh, just, Make sure that your self-worth is divorced from that concept. It's not easy to do. The easiest thing that I have ha I've found is to flip uh, I am a failure to I am a person who failed at this. I am mm -hmm. a person who succeeded at this. And that will show that like you are – that will help your mind divorce those two concepts. And luckily, we were able to come back from those th horrible launches and have three of our best launches ever 
in the next in the next six months. So the other thing is just because there's a failure doesn't mean you will always be a failure. You can rebound. It is possible. Yeah, no, I absolutely love it. Uh, great advice there. Uh, don't hang on to those failures. Learn from them and learn how you can move on and, and keep on the path that you want to go on. Uh, great, great advice. I absolutely appreciate everything that you've brought to the table. Where can people find you? Sure. So if you resonated with any of this, I am over at thecompletecreative.com. I have a podcast called The Complete Creative, where I interview creators about how they built and sustained their creative business. I talk to a lot of writers, but also filmmakers and, uh, and, and other kinds of creative entrepreneurs, advertising people as well. Uh, so that's at thecompletecreative.com, along with about 400 blog posts about how to build a creative career and a career at uh, any level. Awesome. Appreciate it. Are you on LinkedIn, Facebook? Can people find you there? If you just look up Russell Nolte, there's not a lot of us. So I should be the first one. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, on, on, on all the platforms but LinkedIn, uh, I'm at Russell Nolte. Uh, the uh, LinkedIn, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that link is. But uh, uh, if you just search Russell Nolte, you'll find me. All right. I will tag you in the comments as well so people can find you there. I put your website in the comments as well. Uh, as always, I appreciate your time. Audience, I appreciate your time as well. Uh, Russell brought us some just absolutely amazing information today. If you love the value that I brought to you and Russell brought to you, help support the show. It does take time, effort, and a little bit of cash to keep this rolling for you all. Patreon.com slash Adam Sinkus. Uh, donate a dollar, a couple dollars, whatever whatever you can. All the money that I, I raised from that goes back into supporting the show and, and really uh, spent on the show itself. So uh, appreciate your time. We will be back next Tuesday. Uh, I have no idea what next week even brings yet. Every week is a new adventure. Uh, but uh, we will see you all next Tuesday. Otherwise, have a wonderful weekend.